because they are in prison. But is it a prison of their own making? We are forming that prison because we're taking the view from the window. We are their prison. The, the people watching them everywhere, including us. Huh. Oh, man. Whoa. What a movie. Maybe we should just get into it. Usually we do the funny cold open. Nothing funny about that. No. It's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, welcome everyone to a special romantic edition of I Love This, You Should Too. My name is Indy, caught in a prison of his own making, Randawa. Oh <laughs> and with me is my lovely and talented co-host, Samantha Rancho Carne Toros Randawa. Oh, it goes well with my new last name. Is it still new? Yeah, two years. Yeah. I mean, we had our anniversary. There's something off topic we yes. could have used as a cold open, but we've already moved on. <laughs> <laughs> Saskatchewan themed anniversary. So there's like uh, categories for gifts for anniversaries. And there's like paper, steel. And a lot of them are dumb. Cloth. Those are the good ones. I think there's some that are like molasses. And you're like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? And they have like frankincense. <laughs> <laughs> so we made our own. Yes. One was don't lose the house. Yes. Or yeah. mortgage. Mortgage, yeah. <laughs> that was the first anniversary. Number one, mortgage. Number two, Saskatchewan. Yes. Because the we went to Saskatoon. And then got Saskatchewan gifts. Yes. But not from Saskatchewan, though. No, mine was completely <laughs> ordered off of Amazon. <laughs> and uh, next year, number three, the category I think is going to be three. Yeah. That can mean a lot. I like it. You could have bought me a, a trilogy of Wong Kar Wai movies. You already own these, though. Yeah, but I was trying to segue. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> the second of which is In the Mood for Love, which we are going to talk about right now because we just watched it. It's been about a week. Usually we get a little uh, on these a little quicker. Uh, yeah, we're, we had a busy week. Good thing I remember it all. <laughs> so no surprise, this was my pick, a movie that I loved and brought to Samantha for our special romantic week. She's never seen it before. So we're going to start it off with the classic question. Samantha, I loved this movie. Did you? No. Oh, come on. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like... I'm not smart enough for this movie. I think I'm too Ooh, dumb for this I movie. I don't think that's Yeah, it. no, I, I think, think I'm too dumb for this movie. So whenever anyone says that, I think if a movie is completely over your head and you don't get something from it, I think that's on the filmmaker. Okay. I think that there's a failure to communicate with your audience. I think perhaps there's certain things you might have missed and that happens because maybe you're just not... Um, like there's there's cultural literacy. Yes, yeah. it's a it's a different world. It's a different time. Yeah, there's things like that that might not play as well. But sometimes you just might not like it, and it might not be a failing on you. <laughs> I think we have this uh, idea that I don't want to see these kind of art house movies because I'm not smart enough. I don't get it. I don't put in the work. Right. And I I do this podcast in part to try to hopefully dispel that because I think a movie like this. Of course, I'm going to get into all sorts of things of like, oh, why? here's why every tenth of a second in this scene is brilliant. And I <laughs> yeah. could do that. And I would love to do that. But we're not going to do too much of that because okay. we're not a visual. But I think you can also just sit back and watch this story. And if it makes you feel something, that's successful too. Okay. Did you feel something? It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, a, like a nice romance story. Or lack of romance hmm. story, uh, depending on how you look at it. And I think I like understood the basic meaning of it. And I really enjoyed all the fashion um, because she has some like incredible dresses. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think, yeah, I was just a little bit lost in all of the like symbolism and meaning that wasn't like in the dialogue and that kind of thing. Well, there wasn't much in the dialogue at all. So yeah. everything is in those uh, is in those scenes. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it was a little lost on me. I can appreciate it. It's one of those ones that I'm like, yeah, I can see how this is like your one of your favorite movies, like how it's like 
said to be one of the best movies of all time and like by me or by others by others there you go it was it's not just me second greatest film of the 21st century whoa in a 2016 survey of 177 film critics by the bbc damn yeah. i think it's Wong Kar Wai's second greatest film <laughs> do you know what they had number one uh mulholland drive mulholland drive all right <laughs> I knew that would be your response, <laughs> no matter what I said. <laughs> well, it's funny because that is way more artsy and so far so that I think I think a lot of David Lynch is, um, I'm not a fan. I find it uh, masturbatory. Oh. I find like he's like, look how clever I am. I'm David right. Lynch. Although Mulholland Drive is a, is a gorgeous movie in a lot of ways. But we're not talking nope. about that. We're talking all in about In the love. Mood for Love. So you said you think you might not have gotten certain parts of it so maybe let's start there let's each talk about just fundamentally on a very basic level what this movie's about uh -huh. then i'd like to just talk about the romance yes the the relationship between these two characters we of course are going to have to spend some time on the style or the look of this movie mm -hmm. not just in the costuming but that'll be a part of it too but how this movie because it's, it's very distinct to me and i think mm -hmm. gorgeous one of the best looking movies i've ever seen We'll talk a little bit about some political allegories. I feel like that's something that people might not get, and nor should they. We don't know about 1960s Hong Kong very much here, so yeah. we can talk a little bit about that. And then maybe just talk about some things we loved or didn't love about it. Okay. So you thought maybe you didn't get everything that this movie was about. What, it, what is it about to you in a very basic level? We're not even looking into it too much yet. Um... On a basic level, it's like what happens to the people who are left behind during an affair. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like, so basically, it's this man and this woman whose spouses are having an affair with each other and them kind of coming to terms with it and comforting each other and fighting with the urge to also have an affair, it felt like. I feel like you got everything. Okay. I don't think there's okay. more <laughs> to it there. I did it. I think the complicated part gets into when they're doing this kind of play acting. Because it's, uh, just like Samantha said, there are two couples. They move into the same building okay, in Hong right. Kong. They're next door neighbors. They each have a uh, room in someone else's. And it's a very claustrophobic, crowded place, giving everyone no privacy, mm. a... They soon realize that each of their spouses is uh, having an affair with, with the other, and they kind of find solace in each other's company. And they also do this act of play acting, where first they are pretending to be each other's spouse. And mm -hmm. how did this affair start? Right. So they start play acting and be like, oh, my husband wouldn't say that. And oh, my wife would eat this. And they start taking on the roles of each other. And that gets... And that further complicates things because in certain scenes, we think, oh, he's finally making a move. They're going to be together. But no, right. he's pretending to be her husband making the move on his own wife. So we get this kind of um, distorted view of what's happening, what we think is happening. And there is a bunch of kind of misleads in that way mm -hmm. where a scene starts one way and we think we are getting some sort of fulfillment because... I think a lot of us want this couple to get together because we've mm -hmm. just been trained by movies to, right. to want that. Of course, yeah. And we get the, the idea that it's going to happen and then we realize, no, they're not even being themselves now. But that goes on for so long that you're not sure which is them and which is them acting. Right. It, the line there gets blurry. And in addition to that, we have time being a big part of it where you're not sure, is this the same day? Is this weeks later? Is this months later? Mm -hmm. Have they been doing this for two years or two weeks? I'm not entirely sure. Right. Because this movie acts as as a memory. It acts as a memory of something that has passed and cannot be reclaimed. It's like somebody is looking back on it and recounting these things where you're not sure. Was that all in the same day? Or did we go to that restaurant four different times? Right. I'm not entirely sure. And it seems like the film makes you unsure of that mm -hmm. too. And then ultimately, I would say that this is a an unfilled, unfulfilled romance. Although mm -hmm. only recently, because I don't really talk to people about movies outside of this podcast that right. we have. Yeah. Um, I learned that that's not the reading that a lot of people have. A lot of people are like, oh, no, they got together. That's his kid at the end. I'm like, wait, what? I don't see that at all. Mm -hmm. 
but you can take away uh, what what you want. So I don't think you missed anything. Okay. I think in my first watching, the most confusing thing was knowing that they were doing that play acting bit. Yeah. And on subsequent watches, each time I watch it, because you know what's going to happen, you get more from it. It gets right. it gets so much better. I did. So like I always mention this, I feel like when we're doing our podcast, but we uh, will rewatch a little bit of whatever we're talking about, just to kind of refresh it in our memory. And because it had been almost a week since we watched it, um, we watched quite a bit of it. And I did get more out of this watching, even though we were skipping through it a little bit. And I feel like I saw some things and you pointed out some things that um, I don't think I saw or was like cognizant of like it as something to see in this movie. So I do feel like that's true. The more you watch it, the more things you're going to get out of it. And I think that is just his filmmaking in general. There's so much going on. And that's a, a weird thing to say in a movie that is largely silent and just slow motion scenes oh of my people goodness. walking. Yeah, that was what was like kind of hard for me at the beginning. So I was like, I feel like I've already missed like 20 minutes of plot. Because there's a lot of like walking by each other in the dark. and But like... that's what I was saying in the preparation. It's kind of, it's about the mood yeah. more than the plot. It's about what it makes you feel inside right. more than knowing exactly what's going on at some point. Yeah. And I do feel like we talked about in the last episode how like I have a hard time with subtitles because I either read or I watch and then I miss either the dialogue or what's happening in the scene. And I did struggle a little bit with this because... If there's something to read, I'm going to read it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to like only read it. So I felt like the second time we watched it, I didn't need the subtitles as much because I kind of already knew what was going on and like what the, the plot was um, that we were going to be seeing. So I feel like that might have affected my original viewing as well, even though you said like, don't worry about it. <laughs> Although this is probably one of the better movies, if that's an issue for you, because there is so many opportunities where you can just watch and not have to pay attention to the Yeah, dialogue. absolutely. But of course, when they are talking, there's a lot of meaning behind yes. it because there's not much of it. And I feel like when they're talking, there's also things happening in the scene that I kind of missed having just read the subtitles the first time around. So I don't know. I think that's just like failing on my part because I'm bad at subtitles but um yeah i feel like the composition of this movie and the use of that theme was really effective all right well we will definitely get into all of that but let's start and just kind of the things we were talking about and in their relationship so they begin their relationship acting as each other's spouse play acting how they could have fallen in love do you think they really want to know or is this flirtation of some way i think they want to know i i agree i think there is a sense at the beginning for sure that they they want to know they both feel betrayed but they don't act out in anger instead they they want to understand it felt like that like morbid curiosity where you're like this is gonna hurt me yeah and i know it's gonna hurt me and i know i really shouldn't learn any more than i need to but i can't help doing it and I feel like that's how they find solace in this is by being like, yeah, this is shitty and this is what's happening and let's learn. It's a really it. a perverse experiment they're yeah. doing that's only harming themselves. Exactly. Really. It's kind of the uh, the 18 year old equivalent for us would have been uh, going and checking your ex's Facebook afterwards. And yes, like, what? exactly. That's what she's doing now. Like, why would you do that? It doesn't help anyone. Or like but you, going you do it, right? to the pub that you know your ex is going to be at with someone else and just like creeping in the corner. Because you know it's only going to hurt you to see them with well, someone I've, else. I've never done that one. <laughs> oh, just me? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not just you. No, but it just feels like you know it's going to hurt you to see it. But there's a part of healing. Yeah. It's like the ripping the Band-Aid off. Right, like, but this is the opposite of that. They're they're wallowing in it. It's true, but I do think that like by hurting themselves, they are attempting to come to terms with it and maybe heal. It's also all they can do. Mm -hmm. They seem unwilling to actually confront, yeah, their spouses about it. So this seems like all they're capable of. 
they seem very um like impotent they don't have any power to do anything and this Mm -hmm. is what they can do so this is what they do do you think on that first ride home he goes and touches her hand that was for me the first time where i was thinking is that him or is that him acting and uh, their names in this are just mr chow and mrs chan and I'll always get that confused, so I might just refer to them by the actor's name. Yeah. Uh, Tony Leung, who I've talked about before, yes. is one of my favorite actors to ever have lived. And Maggie Chung, who is just fantastic in this as well. So I might call them Tony and Maggie every now and then because <laughs> I keep getting confused who is Chow and who is Chan. Chow and Chan are like very similar names. So I Especially that. because she was um, Zhen in the last movie. So I said that this was a, a sequel, yes. but like spiritually, okay, she has the same first name, but some, t- oh, but that was before she was married. That makes sense. Okay. She was Su Li Zhen, and now she's Chan Li Zhen. Okay. Right. Right. Because their last names are first names. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Chan. So. Mrs. Chan. And yeah, so I'll, I might just call them Maggie and Tony. <laughs> Chan and Chow, very close together. So yeah, just call them by their actor names. Uh, when they ride together at first, I thought, oh, now he is taking the opportunity under the guise of play acting to make a move. And now I'm like, no, that's him being the character. Yeah. I I don't know. I was a little confused by that because it did feel like there was something bubbling under the surface that wasn't them pretending to be their spouses. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's just like other media that I've seen like influencing me on that but I did feel like that there was something there and they were fighting it because of like morals yeah and they do towards the end express like he says I thought I could do this without falling in love but I I was wrong and I guess that's the maybe most perverse part of this is that in the end they find out how this could happen yeah. because it happens to them. Yeah. Especially to him. She doesn't articulate it as much, but I feel like it's there too. You could make an argument though that she is never romantically in love with him. Yeah. It could just be a, a f- deep friendship. It could be that they are both going through the same things and she finds solace in him, but... It felt more like she was attached to him because he was the only other person who like understood how she was feeling is that her marriage i guess but i feel like there's like sometimes where you're like you're the only person who understands Mm -hmm. and it may not be love it may just be that you guys can commiserate on something and i i think deep friendship might be a better way to put it like you said so I'm never sure about that. And the the movie, I don't think, tells you either way. This movie kind of defies what we would want out of a, a Hollywood romance. It's not going to give you any of that. So stop looking for it. Yeah. But w- when we get them in, I think it's 65 or 66 when they're coming back, because this movie takes place in uh, 1962, mm-hmm. when she is back and reminiscing or maybe not reminiscing kind of pining for those times and looking out of that window to where he would be i felt that that is love that she does have a romantic love and a regret that they were unable to act on it right and i guess there's something to be said about movies about the strength of a forbidden love a a love that's so strong that it exists despite not being allowed and i think they are in love by the end but they can't act on it or even express it because not only is it forbidden by uh, the world around them Mm -hmm. that would mean being that which they hate right the thing that brought them together and caused so much hurt they are now almost going to do as well right and they know how much that hurts. So yeah. they are, I guess you could say they are stronger people than than their spouses because they are willing to not act on it. Yeah. And there's a moment in there where it felt like they were both like, well, they did it to us. Let's hurt them back. Mm-hmm. And then they decide not to. They, they, they like get really close to the edge. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I feel like in so many movies, a few that we've discussed on this podcast... It's usually quite straightforward that the cheaters are the villains, the people who are cheated on are our heroes, and they're eventually going to get together, and mm-hmm. then they'll be happy together. We see that very, very often. It's a, it's an easy thing to to make work, but right. Wong Kar does not work like this. And 
there's no heroes and villains. If anything, the heroes are on a track to becoming the people that we would think of as the villains, and they just have to stop themselves from being that. And occasionally he does those things like commenting on how everyone thinks they're the hero of their own story, but in the end, uh, time marches on and your big things, what you thought you were the star of, the big important parts of your life, are largely forgotten. That's a part of his his kind of a uh, style as well. Whoa, man. <laughs> and then I think the other thing that convolutes the romance, in addition to this play acting where we are never sure if someone is being themselves, is the aspect of, of time. Because we get all those shots of the clocks and everything. We get slow motion moments. And there are moments, I pointed some out to you when we were doing a little bit of a rewatch, yeah. that are one scene is actually three or four or five scenes. Yeah. Because if you look at this movie, you could say, oh, they have about 10 scenes together and that's it. But when you closely watch it after having watched it a few times, I started noticing that in one dinner sequence her dress would change. Right. And the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, I caught a little error that they made in the movie. And then I noticed it changed again and it changed again. And that's their really subtle way of playing with memory and with time that if you're looking back at this almost romance from your from your youth, you're going to mix things up. You're going to be like, was that one day that we went to that restaurant? Was that four days? How mm -hmm. many times did we go there? And this movie plays with that as well. So you were never quite sure of... Did this, I don't even want to say romance, but yeah, maybe romance. Yeah. Did it, did this relationship exist over two weeks? Was it two years? I'm not sure. Yeah. I really like the idea that they kept it in this zone that if any of their spouses had been like, you were seen having dinner with this man, like, what's up with that? And she's like, oh, well, you and his wife travel so much for work. I just thought, you know, maybe we'll have dinner a couple times to like not be bored and lonely. Mm -hmm. And it's just like towing the line of safeness. But only if they do it away from everyone yes. because they couldn't do that. Uh, even in that kind of downstairs outdoor noodle place that they both go to separately mm -hmm. and they pass each other on the stairs, they can't sit and eat next to each other there. They have to go to, I assume it's a different part of town yeah. where they go to that. Um, it's kind of like a Western. Steak restaurant. Yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. Steakery. <laughs> Steakery. And we might get into this later, but we were also talking about all of the slow motion scenes. And those are the ones that use the kind of the theme of this movie, uh, Yumeji's theme from Shigeru Umabayashi, yeah. which is one of my favorite pieces of music. And uh, you've heard it many times. Maybe we'll even talk about that later. Absolutely. But all of those slow motion scenes, we started rewatching them um, a little bit just now. And I, of course, couldn't control myself because I'm uh, that kind of nerd. <laughs> where I was like, oh, did you see that look on his face? And you're like, no way. Because it's not, there's nothing big no. in any of these. No. But what I saw through those is I feel like every time time slows down, it is for a reason. Because uh, Wong Kar Wai is a very uh, stylish director, although mm. I think this is kind of his most restrained because the movie itself is about restraint. But uh, now I'm getting off topic. <laughs> <laughs> slow motion, slow, slow motion. Slow motion. Um, those are the moments that make a bigger impact on them even though we don't actually see much happening. Mm -hmm. So for those times when they're just going up and down the stairs, first it's slow motion and they just pass each other and they say, like they nod or whatever and they keep going. And then the second time they both, we get more of his face, but he seems to come to a realization from that. Mm -hmm. And my thinking is this is when he realized that his wife is cheating on him and who it is with because they only go down there when they are eating alone because they don't want to cook for just themselves. Right. And he starts noticing, like, every time my wife is out of town, her husband is out of town. And we get that in just what would be a half second look at each other yeah. if it were in full time. But we get the slow motion with it. So those moments land on us mm -hmm. every time it's in slow motion there's no dialogue so we can really just sit and look at faces look at the construction of the scene and it's done with such intent that i feel like every time we go into slow motion we get yumeji's theme and all that happens is two people walk by each other mm -hmm. you have to acknowledge like this is 
slow motion and set to this music for a reason. And it uh, gives it opens up the opportunity for the viewer to be like, why is that important? And I kind of like that. And I get that that is a like a film nerdy type thing. But yeah. if something is in slow motion or set apart from everything else, it's for a reason. And he invites you to to look at that and kind of get a lot of plot elements from just those looks. Yeah. And that's what I loved about that part. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Yeah, because you were like, oh, didn't you see it? Oh, that's, oh, he knows. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, I feel like those are the moments where I'm like, I got none of that from this. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I've seen it more than once, and that's, uh, that's a big part. I think now I've seen it maybe three, four times. Also, you've learned to, like, analyze film. <laughs> you were a professional film critic for as long as I was. True. For those one year where we got paid for this podcast. Oh, yeah. Also, we don't. So um, send us money or tell your friends to listen to it. Yeah. I guess. I just, like, I don't know. I feel like maybe I'm just down on myself here because this is, like, a very artsy film and I'm not super familiar with that kind of thing. But I think you got most of it. It yeah. was just these little things of, hey, if you look really closely at that, you can <laughs> see this and this and this. If you devoted the same uh, time and effort you do to like Taylor Swift Instagram posts, because you dissect every <laughs> pixel of one of those. True, because they're full of Easter eggs. Almost like Films. a Wong Kar Wai movie. True, true. So let's talk a little bit about the style because I think this movie is just gorgeous. What do you think? It is gorgeous. Um, those dresses that she wears, I'm like obsessed. Like I would wear those today. I think those are a style that's kind of timeless. A but chong sam. Is that what it's called? Yeah. That oh, kind okay. of uh, like the high necked dress. Yeah. I really liked that. And I do think that that could be considered fashionable like here now. Like sure. I, I totally could see wearing that to like a dinner event or something like a little bit more fancy. Um, I loved the patterns of her dresses. I loved how uh, like understatedly elegant she was because it's not like a current movie where the female lead is just like the most gorgeous person ever. And she's the most fabulous and she has the best hair and clothes and like... Wait, you're saying it's not like that? Uh, well, it's like she's more understated than the heroines of today. Oh, see, I was going to say like, you know, she has the perfect hair, the perfect dresses. She's dressed up when she's just going down for noodles. They, they mentioned that like she wears that just to go for noodles. Oh, see, I thought she was like a lot less showy than the lead actresses of today. Oh, perhaps. But she is also playing someone who lives in an apartment building in 1962 Hong Kong. Yes. So she's not playing a, uh, well, in a lot of m the movies you love, it tends to be someone who is already like, oh, I'm the princess of this, or I just discovered I'm the princess of this, or I'm a wealthy uh, interior <laughs> designer or something. Right. Yeah. And I just feel like I really appreciated that she wasn't as flashy and maybe it's just the time and you know i don't know 1960s like fashion as well and i think um maybe i'm just missing it but i really enjoyed that she looked more normal well, or I what i assume is normal what right? i think there is is an authenticity to this movie yeah and to all of wong kar wai's work to me because he has this style that is very much a style. It is full of uh, artifice. Uh -huh. He's choosing these things that don't naturally occur. Everything is quite contrived. But for me, what he does still feels authentic. It doesn't feel like a um, Wes Anderson movie. And I, I do like most of Wes Anderson movies. Mm -hmm. But there's an artifice there that you're like, this is a man showing the cool set design mind he has. Right. While I feel like what Wong Kar Wai does is tries to recreate how something felt for him, because he grew up in 1960s Hong Kong, and he was also a, an immigrant from, I'm not sure if he was from Shanghai, but he was an immigrant from elsewhere in China and moved to Hong Kong, much like uh, Maggie Chung's character. Right. And that's a thing, too, that the, there's characters who are uh, speaking Shanghainese, and then there are the... Uh, 
Cantonese people. And I think Tony Leung's character is meant to be a native Hong Konger, a Cantonese person. Mm -hmm. And that's also a thing that would make their romance more forbidden because it wasn't like cool. Shanghai's people and uh, Cantonese people. Okay. They were still seen as like such separate groups in uh, Hong Kong at that time. Mm -hmm. So that adds another layer to it. But he lived this life. So although I know that the world doesn't look like this, because this is everything looks gorgeous to me, even these kind of decrepit buildings and stairs, it all looks great because mm -hmm. of how he shoots. I truly believe that that's how it feels because I'm a, a failed photographer in my own right. You're and, not. <laughs> well, I haven't had a show in a long time. <laughs> but how I edit, I know a lot of people go crazy with their editing. A lot of people do nothing. I tend to be closer to the nothing. And what I edit was not to remove things or touch people up. I remember places being darker or brighter or more colorful and i like to edit to that because that's how it was in my memory right. so i i photograph because i feel like i want to capture that moment of my life and how it felt to be there and i feel like that's what he's doing as well even though there are these hyper stylized sequences of slow motion and these very lush reds and you know, he's using some of that uh, Kodak 800T and it's got those <laughs> dark blacks oh, and I yeah. love it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's doing all <laughs> of those things. But I feel like he is showing us how that would feel. Okay, yeah. It's kind of like a, a, a low-level version of expressionism of the moods of this scene are kind of coming through in the colors and how things are framed. Mm. Because it seems like we are looking into the real world. But this is very stylized, so it doesn't look exactly regular, but it's somewhere between expressionism and complete realism, which I guess is what a romance is, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a romantic looking movie. But I think the thing we have to talk about, because it's probably talked about every uh, film school that talks about this movie, is the frames within frames. Because I think the first 25 shots of this movie are through doorways or hallways and things like that. Yeah, that was really interesting. What did you think of that? So in the, like we we're talking about like the restaurant scene and how her dress changes and that kind of thing, um, which I didn't notice in the first watch. I found it really interesting the beginning of that scene where you're seeing it through another booth and kind of over a little like restaurant, like half wall, almost as if someone was seeing them and not like making themselves known exactly yes! the, the frames within frames like when we're in the apartment why would we be seeing it just through a doorway yeah because that's how someone watching them yeah. would see it and film watching is inherently a, a voyeuristic act but this is an especially voyeuristic movie because it's that's their biggest fear is being seen by others uh -huh. and we are taking on that role they are afraid of being seen by us Mm -hmm. And it's only those few instances when they are alone that we get to see them not framed by other things. And I know the cinematographer is Christopher Doyle. He's great. He does most of Wong Kar Wai's stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think there were actually three DOPs listed in this one, but Christopher Doyle is really the one who did most of it. And he talks about uh, Hong Kong just doesn't have that same sense of privacy that the Western world has. Mm -hmm. And this reflects that. They live in this environment that enforces physical proximity because there just isn't space for everyone mm -hmm. and there's so many new immigrants coming. But it also doesn't allow for actual intimacy. So these people have to be so close together but without ever being private. Right. So whenever we see them, it's kind of through a doorway just because they have this ever-present sense and fear of other people seeing them. Yeah. The only times the camera comes into a room in their apartment building is when the two of them kind of get locked into the room together when yeah. she can't leave. And then when she goes and plays or maybe just eats with the family she stays with, usually yeah. we always see that from outside of the frame. But in this case, she said, oh, I'm not going out. I'll just sit with you guys. Then the camera comes in there because she's not worried about that outside right. world watching her. Yeah. Yeah. I I didn't clock it as like much as you did, but I definitely had the feeling of, 
a lot of those scenes where it's just them, it, it felt forbidden and like it's being seen by someone who isn't supposed to be seeing it. Like you wouldn't just go up to the booth and say like, hello. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, I saw Chow and Chen. <laughs> I saw them together and like, I wonder what was happening. And like the town busybody almost mm-hmm. seeing it through a window or seeing it over a booth and like that kind of thing. It felt very illicit and kind of a sexier because you're seeing it as if you're seeing something you're not supposed to be seeing. Yeah. And they're just constantly under this uh, threat of gossip. And that's kind of yeah. one of their biggest motivators for, for how they behave in this. Yeah. The scene you were talking about, though, if I may uh, further analyze that one, because <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I love yeah. that. There's so many. This is a movie where I would love to just do a full commentary on because it's every shot is like, oh, so this shot is amazing because mm-hmm. and I could just go and on and on because I the only thing I said when we did our first watch through, it was a, a largely silent one, but there was a shot and I just looked at it and I said, that shot is better than any art I will ever create in my life. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it was. And it yeah. is. It was so gorgeous. But the scene you were talking about, first, we get to see them from the farther away, like someone was watching them. And then we only show them in separate shots. Mm-hmm. They are never shot together. Right. Until she says something about uh, acknowledging that their partners might be cheating together. Mm-hmm. Then we get a whip pan over to him. So now we show that they are showing sharing the same space right. because he is in on it. Mm-hmm. Before they were all separate and they are kind of been separate from the world. They've been very isolated. And now we get to see a link between the two of them. Right. Then when the scene progresses and he also acknowledges that that's, that is the case, that's what's happening. And they're both on the same page. Then we get a shot where they are both on the screen together for the first time. Because right. now they have that shared interest. They didn't have anything before and they were completely alone. And this is the first time we get to see them partnered up in a way. Mm-hmm. And the first time we get to see them share one shot from the camera. Whoa, man. And then all of the framing with like negative space is also just good for isolating the characters. We get to see shots that frames within the frames and that further isolates them as they are becoming more isolated from the outside right. world. but. The shots are mirrored, like we get to see him doing something and her doing something, showing that they are still linked, right. that they share something even though they cannot share the physical proximity. Mm-hmm. And then it just kind of like guides the eye. Sometimes they're in a small frame within a frame on the screen, so you know exactly where to look, you know where to focus, and you're not distracted by a bunch of busyness, even if they are way off center as they often are. Mm-hmm. I also like the stylistic choice of never showing their partner's faces. Yeah, that it's was one thing story. that I was like found interesting. But yeah, I guess it, it doesn't matter. It's not a, it's not something that needs to be dwelled on. Yeah, they're it's, not. In it's this. not about vilifying them. Yeah. If anything, at the end, they empathize because yeah. the same thing happened to them. Absolutely. Is that a plot for any movie where there's a couple cheating? with each other and then the other two get together know about it and then they fall in love and then they're like hey why don't we just trade and then they all are happy and there's two new couples possibly feels like it should be i feel like there's lots of movies where there's like a divorced couple and the one person brings their new spouse and then the couple ends up getting together again but not not usually with like four people that i know of (laughs) And then, of course, the color palette. I don't know if we really need to go into it, but it's just so those like passionate reds. The very few blues we get are in those towards the end when he's sad and isolated and alone. And yeah, I mean, yeah, that was something that made this movie very like stark and like interesting to watch from like a stylistic point, because, yeah, you only get so many colors and then a large amount of it is very dark. And like grays and that kind of thing. And then bright pops of color. I think it is in my top five best looking movies ever made. I think it's just such a gorgeous <laughs> movie. Yeah. I I think it's a very good looking movie. And I think it fits really well with the tone. Like mm-hmm. they made it look like the tone we're supposed to be. Yeah. It's about the feels, man. Yeah, it's about man. the vibes. So many vibes. Such a mood. <laughs> this movie is such a mood. It's a total vibe. It's a total vibe. 
mood for love. <laughs> and that title too. Yeah. It's not like we're in love. We're in the mood for love, but they can never actually fully be there. Yeah. Well, I think the uh, Chinese name is something like a time of flowers, which is a saying that refers to like the best years of your life. Right. Which is a, a, a very sad title as well, because these are the best years of their lives. And they're, yeah. they're miserable. They're so close to something they want. They had something they wanted and this kind of been shattered. And now they are so close to something else, but they can't have it. Yeah. And those are, that's the time of flowers? The flower years or the age of blossoms. I'm glad he didn't name it um, Secrets, <laughs> which is like another possibility for the name of this. Oh. So all uh, titles and plots in a Wang Garwei movie is very confusing because the way he works, like on the day, you don't have a script. They work it out as they go. Oh. There was a time where this was going to be uh, more of a comedic movie with a lot of like back and forth witty dialogue between the two. Huh. There was a time where there were like four sex scenes in it and those were shot. And then it became this really solemn movie about not giving in to temptation and finding solace in another hurt person. I don't huh. know. Because he believes that, like, this has to happen organically. If I come in with this plan, I'm forcing a vision. Right. And he doesn't think that's how art works. Right. So on the downside, I think this was something like a 16-month shoot <gasps> for a movie with just, like, two people walking in slow motion for half of it. That's a long fucking time. Wow. But that's how he works. Huh. Yeah, that's, like, a lot. Right? I would be so frustrated as a anyone outside of uh, an actor yeah. on this. Yeah. But man, yeah, it worked. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, it sounds frustrating and like a lot of work for what was in the movie in the end. Mm -hmm. Like very quiet. But like, he couldn't have gotten there without doing it this true. way. It very would have true. been that first idea they had. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess we should talk a little bit about the music because you know that Yumeji's theme by Shigeru Umabayashi, first uh -huh. from the movie Yumeji from 90. One ish, I don't know, an older movie and is frequently used in this. You well know that that's one of my favorite pieces of music ever because I play it a lot. Yes. <laughs> Indy often plays it at bedtime. Shigeru Umabayashi in general, he's a, a Japanese composer. I believe he's still alive and working. He's done stuff within the last few years, so right. I assume so. He does a lot of good movies. Uh, 2046, which we are going to do uh -huh. next, he does the theme for that. Oh. And oh my God, what a score that movie Am is. I going to know that? Kay. Yeah, you probably will. Okay. It's not as big as, the, as this one in how often I play it, but... He did the soundtrack to a, my favorite video game of the last few years, mm -hmm. Ghost of Tsushima. So he oh, does yeah. a lot of good work. He didn't make the music for this movie, but he did talk with Wong and they said like, oh yeah, this would be good. And they talked about it and he put it in here. Hmm. There's a little bit of original music. I think like the sad, sad violin stuff at the end, which, man, that just cuts through me. It was... Yeah, the theme is quite sad. Yeah, that part was uh, original. And then there's a bunch of Nat King Cole music. And I didn't realize that Nat King Cole did so many Spanish songs. Yeah, that was uh, an interesting inclusion. Y así pasan los días Y yo desesperado Y tú, tú contestando Quizás, quizás it was appropriate for the time because there was an influx of Spanish music in the 60s in Hong Kong. And I think they attribute it to Filipino immigrants bringing that along and it kind of uh, being a part of it. But I guess that dovetails nicely with what I want to talk about next of Hong Kong in 1962. Yeah. 
We'll just do it quickly because I don't really know. <laughs> I've spent two weeks of my life in Hong Kong, so I'm no uh, no expert by any means. Right. But in 1962, Hong Kong is uh, a time and place where independent Hong Kongers, like people who have grown up and lived there, are now mingling with a lot of people who are leaving China because a lot of people are leaving China and they're either settling in Hong Kong or using that as a... Uh, stop as a waypoint on their way out right it's a place of transition it's a place that doesn't fully belong to the western world or the chinese world because it's under british rule technically but it's its own independent right. thing but it's attached to china and it's going to be going back to china so it's a place of transition just as all of these characters in the movie are in times of transition and then when we jump forward it's a uh, 1966 and this is, I think, the beginning of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. So a lot of people are now fleeing the communist state of China. Mm -hmm. And now Hong Kong is so much more chaotic. When they return, the landlady, I guess we'll call her, yeah. is talking about how, like, we're not sure it's going to be safe here. So we're leaving. The apartment itself is in chaos as yeah. well because their apartment is always a microcosm for Hong Kong, right. right? It's at the beginning, it is a place, a meeting place of different types of Chinese people who are forced into physical proximity, but without any real sense of privacy. And now when you come back in 66, it's a place of chaos where people are coming and going. You don't know who is here. right? And the people who are fleeing China at this point are, I think you could say, more more desperate than they were in 62. And this place of transition comes up a lot in, like, they're going and they're eating steaks. They're eating Western food because this is the new Hong Kong that is international and has all of these influences to it. She's booking tickets for other countries. They're using Japanese appliances. They're listening to Spanish-American music. So all of these influences are, are talking about Hong Kong as as a truly international place, as it's becoming a truly international place, and people are trying to figure out where in this new world they belong, or if they belong, because a lot of them are talking about always moving on. Am I moving on to Singapore, or Cambodia, or going back to Shanghai? Those themes seemingly always come back in Wong's movies, because that's what he is, is concerned about, right? Mm -hmm. That was his life. He was someone from I believe Shanghai, who then moved to Hong Kong at a very early age and, and lived through all of this. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. I hear his next movie is a Chinese movie, like, like a Chinese, like a China Chinese upcoming movie. Upcoming movie? Yeah. Oh. And I'm worried about that because his movies are about the independent Hong Kong spirit. Right. And now he's going to be working underneath the Chinese government. And Ooh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to watch it, of course, because he's brilliant, but I'm uh, wary of that. Right. Like with a lot of these movies that I really love, I feel like I'm uh, definitely monopolizing things. How are you feeling? I feel like I don't have much more to add. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a very interesting piece of film. Not an interesting movie, a piece of film. Whoa. Um, I call them talkies. <laughs> you do. This is another one where I can like see and appreciate the importance and the artistry that went into this movie. Um, I still don't like love it, but I thought it was it was good. I think my advice for people watching, if you want to gain an appreciation for this movie, you, you have two ways. You can sit with a notepad and dissect every second or just get a little high. Just watch it while you're high. Get a little high. Kind of feel the vibes of this movie. And you don't even have to read the subtitles and you'll just be broken at the end because it, it works. Yeah, it is pretty heartbreaking. Well, maybe let's talk about a few of our favorite scenes from the movie to wrap up. Okay. Do you have any that come to mind or do you want me to start us off? Um, I think the restaurant scene for sure. Mm -hmm. And the scenes where they're walking past each other up that stairwell in the right. street, like those were very interesting moments, very loaded and like feeling. Um, I thought the whole dynamic of the the kind of this rooming house that they rent from um, 
was really interesting and I loved all of the like vibrant moments there because that was like probably the most lively part of the movie for sure it was with like the mahjong and the um the landlady and all of her comments and everything and it just like I liked those breaks in the movie for sure uh where you get like a little bit of normalcy and how busy life is kind of around them when they're having these moments where they're like the the heavier moments you kind of get this like uplifting fun moment in the hallway of their house so yeah those were kind of moments that stood out to me i had a big list here but luckily we've broken down a few of them already so we don't have to go through all of the here's what the slow motion i think is all about At the end in 66, when they both come back and just miss each other. Uh Again, they first, they just miss each other in Singapore, and then they just miss each other back home, I think. But yeah, there's those two two instances and how they both go to the window and just look out, like looking for the other person. And you watch his face and you see this sadness, but then also a, a longing and He's not longing for his wife. He's longing for this one woman who was the only person that could ever comfort him and he can't see. Yeah. And that was, yeah, those ones were brutal. Yeah. I loved the um, scene where she is out in the rain and she's kind of waiting under an awning and he catches her there and he's all wet and he says, oh, wait there, I'll be right back. Runs, gets his umbrella, brings it back for her. And said, so here, you can use this. And she says, well, I can't take your umbrella. People will know that I have your umbrella and think we were together. And he just says something along the lines of, like, all right, well, then I'll just wait here with you. And they just wait in the rain together. Yeah. I that's love... a romantic moment, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think when you say, like, oh, that's a romantic moment, all the things that you feel in that, you're getting everything. It's just I sometimes will articulate it. Like, I think that is especially good because usually when they're shown out there, they show them through the bars as if they're in a a, a prison Mm -hmm. and they're trapped in this thing that they have together, but the bars are between them still. So they're still being separated. They're not in the same section of the bar. So they're Mm -hmm. in a prison, but they're being kept apart until they gain some sort of when i think they actually fall in love because then you see them in the bars again but they are in the same section so now they are trapped but they are trapped together right and then of course this isn't a prison we are seeing it through the windows of one of the buildings so we are the ones affect and we and everyone else who watches them we're the ones putting them in that prison because that's From the window, from the world around them. That's how they see them. So society is the one that's putting them in that prison. And then, of course, when they're under the awning, they can't go anywhere because of the rain in in a very literal way. But they also have the time to just be together. Mm -hmm. This little tiny space is their only privacy. And they're being held there from like the very literal rain. But also we're seeing that that's... These little moments on a street being silent next to each other, that's all they have because of the world around them. Right. So that's why I think the the little rain scene is uh, <laughs> especially beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. They can't move forward just like their relationship can't <sighs> move forward. And then there was that one kind of fake out scene where we think we are seeing her confronting her husband about an affair. But then we reveal that it is Tony Leung's character and he's play acting as the husband. Mm -hmm. And that one I thought was brutal because they do that and they kind of go back and forth and they talk about like, well, here's how this is going to happen. And then at the end, she breaks down and all she says is, I didn't think it would hurt so much. Yeah. Because they've been talking about this affair that their spouses are having and they've been trying to figure it out. And they're probably, I think, falling in love themselves. And that's what Mm -hmm. the movie's concerned with. But we don't always get back to like, they are so hurt by this. Yeah. Which is maybe the main reason that they won't go forward. Yeah. It could be the societal thing of not wanting people what they're going to say. But also, they know how much this hurts and wouldn't put someone else in that position. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The whole morality of not wanting to 
be like their spouses who've hurt them so like deeply is really interesting to kind of watch play out. And then I think one of the most well-constructed scenes comes towards the end. And now they are doing a, their final role play in the same place that they had their first one. When he first pretended to be her husband seducing his own wife, now they are back there and they're doing another role play, but they are not playing as their partners. They're playing themselves yeah. in the future, which also makes it more confusing and plays with time a little bit more. But they are rehearsing saying goodbye, but we don't know it's a rehearsal at first. So we see them part and he lets go of her hand and she almost turns back to him and we see him getting smaller in the background. And I think now the camera is actually playing things at double speed. So it's messing with our perception of time again. And she ultimately doesn't look back and turns away to the darkness. And then it cuts to black, something that we mm -hmm. hadn't really... I don't know if there was a, a fade to black before. And we get to hear the audio of her crying and him saying, it's just a rehearsal. This isn't the real thing. Yeah. Because it is. But now we are seeing her cry for this relationship, not for the one with her husband. Mm -hmm. And this crying, it doesn't feel like one of those big performative, um, here's my breakdown in this big Hollywood movie. It's her finally letting a little bit of emotion for this man come through because mm -hmm. she's been trying to block it as much as she could because yeah. she couldn't put herself or him in that position. And here there's a, a crack in that facade. And then we see his face and he's he's not crying. And I almost think that this is the the more impressive performance because he is trying so hard not to cry. And Again, I know I talk about how great he is all the time, but man, Tony Leung was so good in this. I believe he won the Best Actor at uh, Cannes this year for that movie. And then we get to hear them talking over the black screen, and that makes it more like a uh, dreamlike or playing with the memory of things that almost were. Mm -hmm. It seems like the exact opposite of that scene at the end of One True Loves, when I'm like, oh, I hope he doesn't rear end her now and it's going to be that whole bit. It's, there's nothing telegraphed in uh -huh. this little scene. Everything is a surprise because I thought it was the real goodbye, but then it's just a rehearsal. And here they're not telling you anything with dialogue. It's just hinting at things that we feel and I think successfully for me, making you feel things that you may not have been able to articulate yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I always talk about in the movies I love. They capture something that I cannot articulate because you can't mm -hmm. always do it with words. And here it's the colors, it's the sound, it's these performances, all of this coming together to to give off this emotion that I can't sum up with words. Wow, man. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you see any of that? Do you feel any of that? Yeah, I think... It's definitely a deeper reading than I got, but I can appreciate all the things that you're saying. And I do feel like upon the second watching, I got a lot more of those things from it, even if it was not quite as deep as you're going. We should probably just go watch it again right now. I have another one, Carway, to watch. That's true. Well, then maybe we should talk about the ending of this movie. Yeah. So suddenly we get things we have not seen before because we get some documentary footage of Charles de Gaulle landing in Cambodia. And also we get, I think it might have been the coronation of um, Nordam Shihanuk. And I only know him because I was in Cambodia for his funeral. He was oh. the prince at this point in 66, goes on to be the king for many years and died in October of 2012 and I was there just after it so maybe it wasn't his funeral but it was the week of so there were the royal palace was all closed and there was just all night vigils and prayers going on outside so right. I went to some of those because I was like I, I'm never gonna see something like this so no, I still I? have a, a button from his funeral of course I'm not sure if he was a terrible man so maybe I shouldn't wear the button I didn't look too far <laughs> into it <laughs> But in Cambodia at that time, it was a good idea to wear the button. Hmm. Interesting. But we get a bit of uh, news footage of Charles de Gaulle landing and going to this. And that was weird. But I guess that kind of talks about this 
nation influx as well. Cambodia is in a similar way. They yeah. were um, colonized by the French and Hong Kong is in a certain similar state of transition at that point. Of course, this is 66. So just before the Vietnam War, which again is going to further dis- destabilize Cambodia. So that's, I think there's probably a very intentional reason why they went with that. And then we get to him going to the temple grounds. I don't know if that's Angkor Wat itself, but it's definitely one of the right. temples around there. Yeah, I recognized it as a temple in Vietnam. Cambodia. Cambodia, sorry. Yeah. That I don't know the difference between all of them, but it definitely looked like that. What did you make of that scene? The first time we watched it, I didn't really understand what I was seeing. Mm-hmm. And then the second time I like understood with the like crevice and the like grass shoved in there and like it was kind of romantic, I guess. Yeah. So the what you're talking about, of course, is earlier in the movie, he talks about an old tradition that if you have a secret, you go and find an old tree mm-hmm. and you whisper it into a hole in the tree And then you pack it up with mud so your secret will never get out. Yes. And here we have him not just going to an old tree, but this thousand-year-old monument, something that will foreseeably last longer than any tree. I think maybe giving a little hint that this secret of his, this memory of his, is going to last longer. It's not going to be something that is going to be forgotten. It's going to stand the test of time, even though it never came to fruition. Because he could have just been doing this at any tree in Hong Kong, and that would have an effect, but it doesn't give you this grand spanning generations kind of effect like going to Angkor Wat does. Mm -hmm. And when you see these ancient grounds, it makes you take a step back and kind of view the whole situation from... Because he's always playing with time and having something so old and something that is so so solid something so seemingly eternal makes you a little more objective and kind of put that scale of time into more perspective it's making you think of all of these things that have come and gone and what still remains and by putting his secret there that i assume of course the secret of his love uh it makes you think that this love that he has is on is on that level it's mm-hmm. on a grand scheme it's not just these moments that we had slowed down that made it very personal but then when he's going to a place like this it shows you that it's eternal yeah and you get like the real weight of how much this is still in his mind and his time yeah so sad it's so sad well, it seems like I like the sad romances because <laughs> earlier we had done the before trilogy, which is not exactly the happiest. Uh-huh. It's sad movies as well. But I think that not just because I love the works of Wong Kar Wai, which I do because I, I love this movie, but there is something that is just as beautiful as is heartbreaking mm-hmm. about this movie. They had just this amount of time together, whether it was three weeks or two years or something in the middle, and they never got to do all the things that they would want to do, but the love that they had is still with them. I think that's what the end of the movie is trying to say. And despite how warped it has become in their memories, it's still there. It's persisted through all this time, and they won't forget it. And I think there is something beautiful and not just sad in that. So that's why I love this movie. (laughs) Yeah. So I love this movie. I think it is absolutely fantastic. If you want to go watch it, if you have a a Criterion subscription, it goes on their stuff. We watched the newly restored restored Criterion version from the Wong Kar Wai box set because that is one of my favorite purchases I've made in the last few years. It's (laughs) very good. Go check it out. If you ask me nicely, you might be able to borrow mine. And next week, we're going to keep it going. We talked a little bit about Days of Being Wild in last week's episode, which is kind of the unofficial first part, Mm -hmm. which deals with kind of young love. Maggie Chung's character was in that. I would argue this is a different character because they don't really behave all that similarly, but they have the same name. Right. And the themes in that one are about those days of being wild, about not 
treating love seriously. Now we get In the Mood for Love, which I think is the best of the three, which is dealing about kind of the sad reality of love maybe in your later adulthood, even though they're not especially old, they are they are married. So mm-hmm. it's dealing with love at a later point in life. And now we are going to watch and discuss the movie 2046, also Ooh. by Wong Kar Wai, uh, next week. And I've only seen that movie once when it came out. I saw it in theaters. I haven't rewatched it on my... Uh, new box set so we're gonna watch that which i believe is going to be a nice wrap-up because it is someone looking back on a history of the loves of their life it is tony leung again if he's the same character is very debatable he is a writer he doesn't seem to act like this character does though so i say it's someone new but we carry on some of those themes we do get to see tony leung and maggie chung together again in this movie with i think the same name so you could argue it's them but maybe not maybe none of it's real who knows who knows we will know next week next week when we discuss 2048 46 46 which was also the room he was staying in when they were writing together towards yes the end. So, and that will be big in next week's movie whoa whoa Whoa, whoa, everybody. (laughs) See you next week. Bye. I like high podcast indie.